Um, the next speaker that I want to bring on stage is uh, Amber Balde from JP Morgan. She's going to talk about how uh, blockchain is becoming a success story at JP Morgan. So thank you for being here, Amber. Good morning. Do I have the mic? There we go. Good morning. Um, I want to reserve one of the superposition shirts in a lady's uh, small, please. Uh, so, <laughs> hi, my name is Amber Balde, and I lead, um, I need the clicky, uh, blockchain product and strategy at JP Morgan. Um, and uh, I have not very much time today to tell you about very, very many things. But one thing I can tell you, to tag off of what Worley was saying, um, so blockchain is kind of the exact opposite thing from quantum computing. Uh, so instead of dealing with anything that's probabilistic, what we're trying to deal with is something that is incredibly deterministic. You want to get the same thing over and over and over. You want to get a lot of people to get the same thing over and over. You want an immutable audit log of something that is incredibly consistent, and it is relatively slow. Um, at the same time, we're looking at using this across finance to solve problems instead of talking about uh, quantum computing, adding all this new kind of secret sauce to the way that you are generating um, alpha in, in trading. We're looking at right now at how you perform post-trade settlement in a very consistent kind of way. Um, I will continue clicking the button until we see what happens. Who wants to take the clicky and then make it happen? Cool, thanks. I, I delegate. Um, so. <laughs> So I don't have that much time to tell you about what blockchain is and how we're using it. So much as what I'm going to talk to you about today is how JP Morgan uh, released a blockchain platform and how it's becoming a bit of a success story for us and hopefully not just us, but for the industry and hopefully even beyond that specific industry. Um, so I guess rewind two years ago and you probably first heard about blockchain as a, uh, I don't have the clicky in my hand anymore. There we go. There's no such thing as the blockchain. OK, ta-da. Thank you. So the first thing, there we go. There's no such thing as the blockchain. Pfft, mind blown, right? Um, so this is, uh, this is something I harp on right now when everybody says, oh, we're going to put it on the blockchain. Uh, there is no such thing as a blockchain. Um, however, there are lots of different blockchains, and they are all architected very differently. Uh, some people now say, oh, we're not using a blockchain, we're using a distributed ledger. Um, some of these blockchains are public, some of them are meant to run in a permissioned environment, uh, but there are very real differences between them. And so if you rewind about two years, uh, when JP Morgan was looking at uh, various blockchains that were available, uh, we said, none of these really meet our business requirements. And this herein comes to the first part of where you get involved in building a project or, you know, rolling your own, as someone would often call it, right? Uh, and that's because what you find in the marketplace doesn't meet your specific needs. This is where the industry, um, and in this case I'm talking about the finance industry, but you could apply this broadly to any industry, uh, really is incentivized to get involved in building platforms collaboratively. Uh, that's because we understand our own business requirements. And as threatened as we want to be by what's happening out in the startup space um, or with tech vendors that want to you know, solve all of your problems for you and promise you the moon, the people that really understand your day-to-day -day business problems are probably you. So when we look at distributed ledgers and we say, cool, you have anonymous participants and completely visible transactions, uh, well, that doesn't meet really any financial regulatory requirements, right? So we want to have a blockchain that has known participants, but with completely confidential transactions and confidential information. So that was where we started. And uh, then we said, well, wouldn't it be great if there was something out there already that we could tag off of? And it turned out that there was an open source uh, project called Ethereum. We were able to fork that and start seeing if we could solve some of the challenges there. Now, if we had not been able to address them, as there are certainly others who had looked at Ethereum earlier and tried to do the same thing, I probably wouldn't be standing here. So all kudos to some wonderful engineers who uh, helped figure it out. Um, so different architectures, very different experiences, um, and uh, this is what I mean when I say there's absolutely no such thing as the blockchain moving forward. So with Quorum, what are we trying to do? We're trying to take uh, a distributed ledger, or it really is a blockchain, it's not just a distributed ledger, but we want to be able to provide an opportunity to have real world governance on top of that. So the idea that code is law is uh, really, really fascinating. Um, it's extra fascinating if you accidentally lock up 90 million of your own dollars in your own smart contract, uh, as may or may not have happened on the public blockchain yesterday. Um, but 
in general, when people say uh, blockchain is just a database, I challenge anybody to think of a time when previously a database kind of production rollout happened wherein somebody lost a bunch of their own money and could not get it back, right? There's always a way to roll back. There's always a higher authority to appeal to. There's always a way, there's someone who holds the liability. There's even possibly someone to sue if something goes awry. So the first thing that we need if we're going to move real core banking systems onto a distributed ledger world is a way to fold in with our existing uh, legal and regulatory frameworks. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have a centralized entity that says this is what's real and this is, isn't what's real. It simply means that there's somewhere to appeal. And possibly if you're talking about a permission network, so a network of known participants, other banks and or counterparties or supply chain or whoever you're working with, that there's somebody who says who should be in and who should be out. Okay. Confidentiality, I already mentioned. Uh, we really can't do business. Uh, we have a, a fiduciary obligation to keep client data private. You simply can't be broadcasting out Twitter for your bank account, which is what something like Bitcoin becomes when wallets are de-anonymized. And finally, security. So we're not assuming trust between participants. Sometimes you hear the phrase trust but verify, especially with rela relation to open source code. I would say don't trust, verify. Right? We do not trust our counterparties. If we did, we wouldn't be doing all this blockchain mumbo jumbo in the first place. Okay, so as Gab mentioned in his initial keynote, blockchain is perfect for open source. Why is that? Well, the first three bullets that you see here I think apply to almost any software project. Um, you want to foster community innovation and acceleration, so you want to bring people together. You want to allow different vendors to implement and approach the problem in different ways. Uh, and you want to foster a diversity of approaches. Let people solve things in different kind of branches, Let's see what works, and then pull back together the various successful uh, outcomes. The last three, I think, broadly apply to general software, but also when you talk about distributed ledger or blockchain systems, they become really, really prescient. So, especially in banking. The first is access to a developer pool beyond just employees. Now, when I was trying to initially sell uh, releasing a GPL code base to senior management at JP Morgan, um, which is the first time such a thing has ever been done, uh, Quorum is our first project that has a GitHub presence, um, they were really uh, enamored with this idea of like free labor. Uh, so that was great. The more developers that you can get to contribute, the more free resources you have. Uh, we can talk about how that becomes a challenge uh, in a minute, but what's more important, I think, is the type of developer resources that you get to come work with you. Especially when you're talking about something like blockchain, uh, you might get people who don't necessarily want to work full time at a bank. You might get people that want to burn the banking infrastructure to the ground. They happen to be the best SMEs on how to build a blockchain right now. So how do you get these people excited to want to work with you? Um, I've spent about two years doing that, uh, and we've had a lot of success. So on Quorum, which is the, the blockchain that I was uh, mentioning before, this is the one we released. For example, we partnered with uh, the Zcash Foundation, or the Zcash company, um, to implement the world's first uh, zero knowledge settlement layer on top of an enterprise blockchain. It's completely open source, it's on our GitHub. Uh, and uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with what zero knowledge proofs are, it's a mathematical way for two parties to prove something uh, absolutely objectively happened to a third party without that third party knowing either of those two inputs. Um, it's kind of interesting to talk right after quantum computing because again, it's kind of the opposite of that thing. But what we're doing is, is we're providing mathematical proofs that follow information through its life cycle, right? So the more provable things become, the less you have to rely on trusting an intermediary. Historically, those intermediaries have been banks. So to keep going here, we want fully auditable code because that builds systemic trust. By auditable code, I mean open source code. When you start talking about something like mathematical proofs, it would be really good if other people can look at them and prove that they function as designed. Especially when you talk about things that rely heavily on cryptography or crypto primitives, you really, really want to make sure that the systems function as designed. I think at their heart, blockchains are really an information security product, and the more open source information security products can be, the more we can, again, not trust them, but verify them. 
So for distributed ledger, it just absolutely makes sense from the beginning that if you're going to want to trust this kind of a system, don't trust it, have someone audit the code, and then um, you can begin using the system without having to uh, you know, place inherent trust in how the tech works. And finally, monetization of applications, not protocols. So uh, this is akin to give away the operating system, charge for the apps. Okay? So, at JP Morgan, are we going to try to monetize a, the blockchain? No, I think that's kind of silly, right? Uh, it is kind of like that ecosystem platform thing. The more people that use the ecosystem, the more you can release products into that ecosystem uh, that are, uh, you know, commercial products that, that generate revenue. Um, now, when it comes to something like Quorum, it's, an, it's, a, it's a general platform, just like the Ethereum blockchain, uh, in that it's really just a de uh, distributed, decentralized virtual machine. You can put anything on top of that. Right now, we're focusing on building financial applications, but for example, uh, Genentech and Pfizer picked up the same platform and they built a drug provenance tracking uh, system on it with a startup called Chronicled. That was really cool. We found out about it in the press, right? So that's how you start to know that your ideas are catching on. So it takes, uh, it takes a village to build an open source community. Um, I think we already asked how many people here work for actual, like, a tech company. Uh, okay, hand, show of hands, who works for a tech, tech company? Okay, now who works for a non-tech company whose CEO has said, you're now a tech company? Awesome. Okay, so many, many hands. Right. Uh, well, unless you uh, really have, uh, unless you really have somebody who picks up the phone and does customer support for platforms that you are are supporting, and goes out and makes sure that your stuff is getting certified on various uh, Linux distros and is available in Azure and all these other things, you kind of aren't necessarily running a core tech platform product. It is hard, and it takes a lot of work. Um, and in that sense, it's really hard to run an open source source project from within a bank, or any corporate really, because what do corporates care about? Their bottom line. So what does a successful open source project look like? Uh, well, definitely there's a diverse uh, membership or a diverse community that's contributing code. So it's not just coming from one entity. You can open source code all you want. It doesn't have to be good, you know, and it doesn't have to be well supported. You can just put it out there and then have your own employees work on it and say, congratulations, you know, we have an open source project. Uh, but what you really need to be doing is pulling in people from around the world that see their own incentive and why they want to to contribute. And you get some cool stuff out of that. So for example, this slide is from uh, the recent Ethereum Developers Conference, uh, which was held in Cancun as another benefit of, uh, of, of having an open source project. Your dev team gets to go hang out in Cancun. Um, and the company who presented this was called AMI. They're a startup out of Taiwan. So this is their slide. I didn't tell them to put JP Morgan is cool for a bank on it. They did that all of their own accord. Uh, and it's, that's what we, we really want. Right? That's what we want out of this. If open source is a recruiting tool for people who don't necessarily want to work for a bank, when they spontaneously say, well, JP Morgan's cool for a bank, or people tweet at me like, I don't hate JP Morgan anymore, um, this, is, this is like a win. This is a huge win uh, for, for both the company and the community and the industry. Um, but they won't do that. It's not just about winning hearts and minds. You need to have people who want to use your pl their, the platform because they're going to get something out of it. They can build something on it that they want to monetize, or they can access their consumers better. Right? So blockchain in that way, it's a little bit different than some other open source projects. I think it's closer to an open API. So if you think about, um, if you're a corporate, not a tech corporate, but like a bank, for example, and you want to open source something, the, the, um, the story that's going to, get, uh, going to gain the most traction is not will people like us more because we put this generic tech out there, but it's more like uh, can we drive business through this open source product? That is a really tough question to answer. So look at Netflix, for example. They open sourced Chaos Monkey, lets you kind of do a whole bunch of network resiliency testing. Does that make people watch more movies? Arguably not, right? With blockchain, you put this kind of general platform out there. What do people build on it? Marketplaces. What do those marketplaces need? Financial products. 
All right, so as a successful open source project, what does something start to look like? For example, um, we have a, a quote from Market in here that simply says, anybody who's not open sourcing their software is doing a misservice, and you know, they also like JPM, good stuff. Um, and then finally, Big Pharma turning to blockchain, that's the, the other project I just mentioned. Um, so having people that you didn't incentivize, you didn't market to, you didn't ask to work with it, pick it up and use it because it was their best choice. That means that you're really doing something revolutionary. But it's a challenge. Um, within a bank or a highly regulated entity, I can't run a Slack channel for the public, right? That's a problem. Uh, you know, you get a central bank that wants to make a pull request because they've, contrib they've built an actual uh, platform on top of your code and like Reg Affairs has to get involved. Um, it's a challenge. So I think specifically within banking, this has always held us back. How do we collaborate with our competitors to build a platform that we all benefit from? A rising tide may lift all boats until it looks like some sort of like uh, collusion antitrust problem. So how do you create a pricing model off that, right? These are challenges and they're things that we need to be aware of and kind of find this delicate balance. That's where something like the Symphony Foundation can really be helpful in providing kind of arm's length or kind of um, you know, oversight or collaboration space where we all get together and can discuss and move forward collectively, right? And then finally, like, you're not going to get a benefit tomorrow, necessarily. Just throwing code out to the world, is it a long-term hiring play? Do people have to build these apps before the platform is worth something? It's really a much longer-term gain than just, can you show me the ROI? And getting management to want to buy into that vision can certainly be challenging. And I already mentioned the tech support questions. So many tech support questions. Uh, so, you know, we balance that, you know, it's a balance between, um, you know, what, what does the business get out of it today, where are you going, and making sure that you're delivering the right solutions in the right time, hopefully to address real client concerns. And here's our, uh, our long journey. Um, open source is not simply, congrats, you dropped some code. It's can you support it, can it grow, um, can it move towards being a real enterprise production product, uh, and uh, where is it going to be in five years? I think I recently read a statistic uh, from a Deloitte white paper that um, I, I want to say it was almost 90% uh, of open source projects or initial repos are abandoned within the first uh, 24 months, right? You don't want, especially if that's a, you're, you're at a corporate, it becomes reputational risk. You don't want to be that, right? So you have to have a long-term strategy for how you're going to support these projects. Ta-da. Thank you. Good? Thanks. Thank you. Okay. I don't know if I have time for Q&A or not. I've got a question ahead. before you, okay. before you sure. leave. I mean, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, you touched both on sort of selling it to the upper management and sort of some of the actual technical challenges to open sourcing banks. Which one was the most difficult one to solve? Um, I definitely, I, I think the, uh, probably selling it to, to management yeah. is more difficult, right? But um, in, in the same way when we're creating use cases uh, or building business applications on top of blockchain, I say we don't build tomorrow's software to today's technical limitations. Yep. Because between the time, for example, um, I know one specific use case that comes to mind, where when we started uh, talking with the lawyers about it, uh, the, uh, the transactional throughput time of the system was a dozen transactions per second. Yep. Uh, by the time, and it was, it was holding us back from wanting to do the project, by the time uh, the lawyers said, yes, we should go ahead and do this, or no, we shouldn't, uh, we had actually um, increased the factor of throughput through the system by a factor of 100. Wow. So uh, it's, it's definitely, the tech will get there, it's the network coordination problems and the, the people and the collaboration that will hold us as an industry back. Absolutely. Thank you, Amber. Thank you so much.